I've been teaching music for about half my life. And the more I teach music, the more I feel that music teaches me. It teaches me about life, teaches me about attitudes, teaches me about the way we interact with our communities. And most importantly, it teaches me about how we work with failure and whether it's our enemy or our friend. So that's how you get to the title of my talk, How to Fail Magnificently. And well, in music education every year, we get thousands of young people who take up an instrument for the first time. And if they're in classical music, we try to teach them the works of the immortals, Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven, and so on. But I suspect that when they're not playing the piano and they're not playing the violin, they're more likely to be listening to Beyonce, Ed Sheeran, and Lady Gaga, and I have no problems with that whatsoever. Now, if you go to a young music student and you say, give me two words, two words that are the most important to you in music, unfortunately, I don't think you'll see these names at all. You'll actually see the words examination and competition. Now, I'm not here to speak ill of either of these because my career has overlapped with uh, helping students prepare for examinations and preparing students for competitions as well. However, I'd like to talk a little bit about the attitudes we take in being competitors or taking up examinations. Let's look at the root words. They may not mean what we think they mean. Competition actually comes from the root to strive for. That's really quite interesting because it has nothing to do with actually achieving something. It's just the idea of the effort it takes when you're trying to achieve something. Examination, on the other hand, has its roots in to weigh, to ponder, to consider. And I think that society works a whole lot better when we're a bit more considerate. Now, this brings us to this attitude of examinations and competitions. Interestingly enough, you'll notice that in neither of these definitions does it talk about vanquishing your opponents and me being number one and you're number two, you peasants. <laughs> right? Instead, it talks about the idea about bringing out the best in us. If you strive for something, if you ponder, you weigh something, it makes you a better person. But yet, too many people go into examinations and competitions not to bring out the best in themselves, but to be the best. And the difference between these two definitions, for me, is all the difference in the world. Now, if you were to put this in a, a, a sort of way that makes sense, I think it's all about winning versus learning. Which of these is our goal? If our goal is to win, if that is the objective, this is what your path could look like. You try to win, that's your objective, to win. But you can't win all the time, so you fail to win. So you try again to win, and you fail again to win, so you quit. And the reason is, your objective is to win, and if you don't win, that's the end of the road. There's nothing you gain from it. If your objective is to learn, your process is very different. And here we can appropriate the words of Samuel Beckett. Ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. Here, failure is just one step on the path to pro progress. It's not the end of the journey. And no one knows the idea of treating failure as a part of the journey as Benjamin Zander, uh, seen here in a video by PopTech, where he doesn't just find it useful, he finds it fascinating. You made a mistake in the middle and you made a face. You remember you forgot a little bit and you went, ah, like that. Ah. People do that when they make mistakes. I recommend when you make a mistake to go like this. How fascinating. <laughs> it's much better. It's much, much better because it, it takes away that, you know. So, how fascinating. Try it on the golf course next time you're out. It, yeah. It's actually quite difficult to do because when, the, when you make a mistake, the body pulls down, you know, it pulls down. Try it next time you make a mistake. You're just about to pull down and you say, how fascinating, like that. It's very good. <laughs> okay, here we go. 
Oh, we made a mistake, so how fascinating, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, don't make a face, go half fast. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right? I have my own story that relates to this. When I was studying in the United States, I was playing this piece that had this really difficult section. And I was actually, you think that you're there as a musician to make good music. But my mindset was actually quite different. I wasn't necessarily there to make good music. I was sure to make sure that I didn't make mistakes. So you're always under pressure that the definition of excellence is not how many good things you produce, but how few mistakes you make. And I had a chamber music coach who was quite wise because he saw that not only was that section affected if I was gonna make a mistake, but the music that came before it had a sense of fear because I'm reaching that section, I'm gonna make that mistake. And you could hear it. So he said to me, Andrew, if you're going to fail, fail magnificently. And he gave me permission to make a mistake. So not because I didn't practice, not because I didn't try, not because I didn't care. He allowed me to make a mistake so long as I did it fearlessly. And it was all right, because you can learn from that. But if you make a mistake just out of fear, it's harder to learn from that. So that was the lesson I learned. I found from then, 13 years later, that if we can treat even failure as a learning experience, then there's nothing in the world that you can't treat as a learning experience. Take concerts, for example. This is the fabulous violist Nobuko Imai. She's 76 years old and she fills concert halls, and she gets standing ovations. Remarkable, remarkable artist. And the one of the reasons why she has this magnetism is that she still reaches for new heights. She still strives for something more. And I managed, I was actually sitting just a few feet from her when she performed. And, you know, she was playing something that was way too difficult for one would think the viola to play. And she played it magnificently, but she did make one mistake. Did she scowl? Did she go, <gasps> no, she actually smiled and she went on. And I learned so much from that moment because she picked challenges so monumental for herself that making the occasional mistake was quite simply the price of entry if you strive for greatness. So there's so many things to do with performances that actually teaches as much as examinations and competitions. You see here whether we communicate uh, through our body language. Is it through eye contact or no eye contact? How do we actually move not only with our instruments, but with uh, the communication as a group? How do we make decisions? If we play beautifully, you can learn something. If we fail magnificently, you can learn something. If we fail not so magnificently, you can learn a little bit as well. You know, and so much of this is about how we work with other people, how we communicate that to an audience. Basically, what you see in a concert is how we perceive community and society. There's so much that we can gain from concerts if we treat everything as a learning experience. So I'd like to now tell you two stories. The first is that of a bulldozer parent. I think you've heard of helicopter parents. So those are parents who just hover around their kids all the time. A bulldozer parent is different. A bulldozer parent believes that my child should not have any obstacles. I shall come in and move it out of the way. And so what happens is that children never learn to face challenges themselves. I was a judge for a competition, and I was told there's this really irate parent outside. They need to talk to the judges. And so I went with my colleague, and we went to see this parent. And this parent said, okay, before you say anything, I know my son shouldn't have got first place. I agree. I know my son shouldn't have gotten second place. But third place you gave to that other kid, and I think my child is better than that kid. Third place. Before we could say anything, he said, before you say anything, I just want you to know I'm a professional too. 
And how fascinating that I made this mistake. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> With the PowerPoint. Um, so I'm a professional too. So I said, oh, here's the problem. So he's another musician. He probably has a different idea about competitions than I do. So, you know, it's okay. He's a musician. I'm a musician. I can talk to him as a musician. Then he says, yes, I'm a professional too in finance. My articles have come out in the local newspapers. I have been consulted as an expert in uh, the interest rates. So before you say anything, I just want, I know you're a professional, he said to me, but I let you know, you know, I'm a professional too. My response to him was five words, but this isn't your profession. And then I said to him, look, I'm a professional in music, you're a professional in finance. Would you take my advice on the stock market? Now, what was saddest about this was his son was right there, watching this go back and forth between us. And I just don't know what lessons his son learned. I know what lessons he could have learned instead. He could have learned about congratulating his fellow competitors. He could have learned a bit about humility. He could have learned a lot more about music. But those opportunities were missed. And that's how we get a society where you see this kind of headline. My child was not selected as head prefect. By the way, this is a, this is a primary school child, 11 years old. Mother appeals to Ministry of Education. That's a bulldozer parent for you. But I don't want to end on this kind of note. I want to tell you a bit of, you know, that there's a bit of hope left, right? So I'm going to tell you a different story. And the story I'm going to tell you is called The Value of Disappointment. I was judging another competition, and this 11-year-old uh, came up and performed, and I didn't think it was terrible. I didn't think it was fantastic either. But he walked back to his seat, and you could tell he was just devastated. Right? He was so disappointed in how he played. And I know that face because we've all had that face. We've had that face when we know it sounded so much better at home. <laughs> How come it didn't sound like at home? I did it like 10 times at home. It sounded fabulous. My grandmother agrees and my cat thinks so too. You know? <laughs> and so I couldn't let him leave the competition like this. So I, I said to the room, I didn't point him out uh, specifically. I said, there was one student here who felt really, really disappointed. And let me tell you, Disappointment's not your enemy. Disappointment's your friend. Disappointment means you care. And if you care, it means you'll go back, you work harder, you come back, and you'll do better. That sense of disappointment will drive you to success. And he smiled, and I thought, mission accomplished, all right? At least he'll go back without a prize, but a bit happier. I saw him one year later in the hotel lobby, same competition, one year later and I was on my way from lunch or something, and I said, hey, I remember you. You're the one with disappointment. <laughs> and he smiled, and his mother, ever supportive, one of the, the, you know, the most supportive mothers I've ever seen in my life, you know, took that opportunity to even ask for some advice on the instrument. And so this is him and me in the hotel lobby, and I'm giving him a short violin lesson over here, and he's age 12. And that's a remarkable story for me because I found out that his mother takes her two children to competitions, but when, if they don't win, she makes sure that they go and congratulate the winners. She makes sure that they read the comments of the judges regardless of whether they come home with a trophy or not. And that's the kind of way we treat competitions and examinations as learning experiences not just winning or losing ones. And no good talk about music can go on or can finish without actually some music, right? So I'd like to invite, he's now 14 years old, this is Ian Yoon. <clears throat> and we're going to perform for you a transcription of Bach's invention number one for violin and viola, originally for keyboard. I don't know if we're going to play this fabulously. Every live performance is an uncharted wave. Uh -huh. <laughs> I promise you this, however. I promise you two things. 
if we make a mistake, we shall fail magnificently. And number two, we'll find it fascinating. We hope you enjoy this. box. invention number one, some music for you. Thank you. 